I'm going to talk today about the legacies of British slave ownership. In August this year, 2020, the statue of Edward Colston, a Bristol slave trader and one of the directors of the Royal African Company, the company that in the 17th and early 18th century delivered captives from the west coast of Africa to be enslaved on the plantations of the Caribbean. That statue was toppled and Colston was unceremoniously dumped in the harbour where the slave ships had once moored. The argument over Colston climaxed in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and the impetus this gave to huge demonstrations of black, brown and white, mostly young people in the UK. This was a significant moment after two decades of debate and contestation in Bristol over the statue and the name of Colston, action was taken. The statue of a slave trader put up in the Victorian period as a statement of civic pride, one of those who built Bristol's wealth and power, the embodiment of a tradition of business enterprise and philanthropic endeavor. The city fathers at that time wanted to articulate this for posterity, for the future. At stake were different understandings of who matters and why. In the 21st century, there was a determination that what Colston stood for should be overthrown. Slave traders should not be commemorated in this way now. Put him in a park or museum with a proper account of who he was, what he did, and how others suffered because of it. The contestation was over a history and a city. Bristol, a city whose slave trading history contributed so centrally to its wealth, a very contested history. Which histories, whose memories count? Should it be the merchant venturers, the great corporation which was central to the slavery business and which has retained influence in Bristol over generations? Or should it be the African Caribbean descendants living in Bristol who are deeply upset and troubled by this celebration of someone who is involved in the capture, transportation and enslavement of their ancestors? We need to learn to think critically about the statues and street names that litter our towns and cities, the stories they tell about the past, what do they tell us about the present and what are the implications for the future? We're now engaged in what we might call a struggle over representation. Who is to be remembered and how are they to be remembered? In part, this is a struggle about the future as well as the present. Who's going to have the last word? Should it be Colston? Should it be Nelson? Should it be Mary Wollstonecraft? All people whose statues have provoked a great deal of discussion and debate and trouble in these last months. From the moment of the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 and then of slavery in 1833, the people to be remembered in the United Kingdom were the abolitionists, especially William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson. The slavery business and the wealth it engendered were to be forgotten. Britons enjoyed congratulating themselves on their magnificent gestures in ending the trade and then slavery, defined as their gift of liberty to others. What got erased in this way of remembering was two centuries of intimate involvement in the whole slavery business by slave traders, slave owners, merchants, investors, shippers, sugar refiners, makers of fetters and chains, and all the multiple traders associated with a business that supported thousands. Abolitionists were proud of what they had done and keen to celebrate it. Their hero, the immortal William Wilberforce, 
and he has continued to dominate British memories. Politicians, both Labour and Conservative, delight in recalling abolition as one of the great moments in what they define as our history. After 1833, the slave owners, those most obviously involved in the exploitation of enslaved labour, hurried to abandon that identity, often together with their estates, and recreate themselves as simply metropolitan men, members of the elite, unsullied by connections with slavery. They forgot their histories. Forgetting was an active process, not something that happened by chance. The terms denial, avoidance, evasion, these terms are all peculiarly relevant to the difficult colonial history that we have in the UK. The forgetting of slavery, part of the wider disavowal, and by that term, I mean the capacity to know and not know at the very same time to repress uncomfortable memories, that disavowal is now being challenged. And that challenge has fueled the determination to put race and slavery back into British and imperial history. This was the inspiration behind the legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, which I have been associated with at UCL for 10 years. The LBS project concerns the legacies of the slave owners, the marks that slave ownership has left on Britain and its empire. We are well aware that exploring the, le the legacies of ownership in no way encapsulates the legacies of slavery as a whole, far from it. We have not addressed the history of slave trading or the systemic effects of slavery on the British economy and society, the increasing demand for manufactures, the lower costs of raw materials, the institutional innovations in credit and commerce, nor have we focused on the presence of black people in British society over centuries or the long history of racial thinking and its life into the present. But slave ownership has provided a lens through which we can explore key aspects of British involvement in the slavery business. How did slave owners, both individually and collectively, operate as transmitters of slave wealth and racialized identities into the metropole? What were their activities economically, politically, and culturally? Our project began with the compensation records, the records of the claims made by slave owners for compensation in the wake of emancipation. 20 million pounds was paid by the government, meaning British taxpayers, to the slave owners in the British West Indies, Mauritius and the Cape in order to get their agreement in parliament to emancipation and in recognition that it was, quote, their property that was being taken from them. Furthermore, the freed slaves were to work as apprentices, so-called, unpaid for their former masters for four to six years. Slavery was seen in Britain at that time as a national sin. That was what the abolitionists had achieved. It had been sanctioned by the Crown and Parliament, by law and custom, and all Britons had benefited from it. Therefore, compensation, it was believed, should be paid. Only a few radical abolitionists objected to this payment of compensation, shocked that a campaign that had been based on the immorality of owning people as property should come to this. Each slave owner had to claim for the in enslaved people that they owned and meticulous records were kept by the commissioners and this archive 
which is kept in the National Archives at Kew, provided our starting point for the research. There are about 47,000 individual claims that we have recorded in our database. Our major concern has been with the roughly 3,500 absentees, those who were living in Britain at the time, who received money. That way, we get at Britain's involvement in slavery. Those absentees got between 40 and 50% of the 20 million, about 8.2 million, equivalent to about 16% of total state expenditure in 1834. The compensation was for the people. It represented part of what was defined as the value of the enslaved men and women who had now been freed. It was not associated with the land which the owners kept. So this was the last moment at which enslaved people now being freed were valued in monetary terms. And that cash came into Britain and into the hands of slave owners. There were 670,000 enslaved men and women and claims were made in relation to each of these individuals. The enslaved were valued according to geography, gender and skill. Those enslaved in Jamaica, for example, were valued as worth less than those in Guyana. For Guyana was so-called new land where the levels of productivity were very high. Men were almost always valued more highly than women. Skilled men were valued more than field hands. Some of these absentees received very large amounts. John Gladstone, for example, the father of William Gladstone, who was to become later in the 19th century, the Liberal Prime Minister, received over a hundred thousand pounds for what was called his property in 2,508 enslaved men and women in British Guyana and Jamaica. Others, especially women, owned, so supposedly, much smaller numbers of enslaved people. In the 78% of the cases where we know the sex of the awardee, 41% were women, 59% men. The proportion of women dropped by half among the absentees. We have found incidents of slave ownership across Britain. There is a heavy concentration in the great slaving cities of London, Liverpool, Glasgow and Bristol. But there are also clergy across the country retired West Indians in spa towns such as Cheltenham and Leamington, the sons of military men living in such unlikely places as Sheffield, merchants in Newcastle, widows and daughters living on annuities in small towns. There are a disproportionate number of claimants in Scotland, the direct legacy of those Scots who went to the Caribbean seeking their fortunes. Not all those who received compensation were directly involved in the ownership of plantations and people. Mortgagees, annuitants and trustees all figured substantially. We have investigated the commercial and financial, political, cultural, historical, physical and imperial legacies of these men and women. And our findings are freely available on our database. The analysis that we developed is in our collectively authored book, Legacies of British Slave Ownership. Our work shows that the wealth derived from slavery made a significant contribution to the development of modern Britain. It supports the case made long ago by Eric Williams the Trinidadian historian who was to become the prime minister of an independent Trinidad in his classic text, Capitalism and Slavery. It demonstrates 
that the wealth from slave ownership was among the significant forces reshaping British society and culture in the late 18th and 19th century. Furthermore, we have shown that the flow of human and financial capital from the slave economy to the remaking of the commercial and industrial fabric continued long after Williams investigated well into the mid 19th century. We've demonstrated the continued significance of the wealth of slave owners, particularly associated with the new colonies, Guyana and Trinidad. The West Indians, as they were called, continued to wield political influence in Parliament and their support for new forms of unfree labour, particularly indenture, was critical. They were also engaged in the shift from the first so-called, from the so-called first British Empire to the second, once the Caribbean was no longer so profitable. They dispatched human and financial capital to the East Indies, Canada, and Australasia. The power of these slave owners and their descendants was not just economic and political. Over generations, they had been bringing ideas about black people and their supposed characteristics into the metropole. This was one of the routes by which racist ideas were circulated and popularized. In the period after emancipation, notions of racial difference had to be reconfigured for slavery was no longer there to hold them in place. New legitimations for racial hierarchies had to be formulated and slave owners and their descendants played an important part in this. Since 2012, we've been working on the second phase of our project, which concerns British slave owners in the Caribbean between 1763 and 1833. We are tracking British slave owners across this period, which marked both the high point and the partial decline of what used to be called King Sugar. Once again, we are focusing on the absentees, many of course of whom were transatlantic figures living between metropole and colony. And we've been documenting their legacies economically, politically, and culturally. And that material is also there on our database. My own current research and writing focuses on Edward Long, the author of the three volume history of Jamaica, which was published in 1774 and which remains the standard text on 18th century Jamaica and is still in print today. Born in England, Edward Long came from a family of slave owners who had property in Jamaica in both land and people over generations. He lived there for 11 years, actively managing Lucky Valley, the sugar plantation in Clarendon in central Jamaica, which he owned and which depended on the enslaved labor of 300 men, women and children. In 1768, he returned to England and became active in the struggle against the abolition of the slave trade. His history strongly defended slavery as a necessary institution in a plantation economy and one which contributed much to British wealth and power. Long attempted to theorize the difference between black and white on the basis of his experience and in dialogue with the debates which were taking place at that time amongst enlightenment thinkers as to what it meant to be human. Long believed that black people were essentially different from white people and that they were born to serve. His ideas about racial difference were influential both in the United Kingdom and in the United States and beyond. In my work, I explore his family, his time as a plantation owner in Jamaica and his writing, the narrative that he created of the island and its peoples 
and its importance to the power and wealth of Britain. I situate all this in the context of the development of a system of racial capitalism, a form of economic and social organization built on the racialization of peoples, black, brown, and white. Our project has spawned many offshoots, work with schools, museums, and art galleries, with networks of local and family historians across the UK and beyond. We've mapped the slave owners across the country with the help of new technologies, researched the collectors and connoisseurs amongst the slave owners whose artworks have become part of our major national collections in the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery, the Tate and the British Museum. We've worked with the National Trust on their project to discover the histories of slavery and colonialism in the properties in which they own. We've made television programs which have enabled us to reach audiences way beyond the academic. We collaborate with French, Dutch, Australian, Canadian, and US historians who are doing related research. And together, we're building a picture of a global system of racialization and capitalist exploitation across the British Empire and the world. And for the future, our hoped for new project, Valuable Lives, aims to turn now to the lives of enslaved women, men and children in the final decades before emancipation, putting together the story of the plantations and of the people uh, who lived and worked and died there. Thank you.